Tigran pointed to a squalid mud hut. Spantamano started up. His eyes cleared. Zara. That's who he's been looking for for so long. He walked quickly, almost ran towards the hut. Why hadn't he spoken to her for so many months? Did you imagine that you no longer love your wife? You loved her yesterday, and always, even though you didn't admit it to yourself. Isn't that why you didn't let Zara go home? Let the Oroba disappear? What do you and Zara care about him? Even if Zara were a diver's daughter, you need her. You need her. He pushed open a door made of gnarled Saxol trunks and stopped at the threshold. Zara was squatting in the corner, holding her cheek and rocking from side to side, moaning hysterically. She had a toothache again, the harsh winter, overnight stays around campfires, icy water, coarse food. All this did not go in vain for the snow-white teeth of the lovely Zara. She didn't sleep all night either. The toothache was aggravated by anxious thoughts. What will Spantamano do now? Will he let her go home? And if he doesn't let go, what should she do then? Should I ask Deoka to take me to the Maraconda? But will Deoka agree? Maybe I should run alone like Alangar ran. But will she make it alone through the desert to the oasis? Zara suffered both from toothache and from thinking. She cursed everything in the world, hated herself, and even more fiercely, Spantamano. And so he came. Zara, Spantamano whispered softly. She shuddered. It had been a long time since her husband had treated her with such affection. Her eyes warmed for a moment, but then a terrible, aching pain drilled into the tooth with renewed vigor. Zara clung to her cheek with long, dirty nails and moaned louder than before, almost howled like a wolf. Oh, the damned one. Did you need Zara only when you were alone on your land? She shot her husband a burning look. If eyes could pierce like arrows, Spantamano would have fallen lifeless on the spot. You should be damned! She hissed angrily and rushed out of the hut into the yard. Spantamano stood for a long time at the threshold, head down and eyes closed with his palm. Zara's words brought him out of the stupor that had lasted since yesterday. His brain cleared up. He took a deep breath, smiled bitterly, waved his hand listlessly. You fool. What do you need Zara for? Why do you need Dayoka and all this thieving rabble? Your friends are not here. The leopard sat down on a dilapidated mat and gave himself up to thought. He knew that he had suffered a terrible defeat. But this is not the end. You're broken, Spantamano, but you're not alone. Even if there is no one around you, you are still not alone, Leopard. To the dive of the cowardly creatures, the earth is big. Margiana, Gandhara, Iran, Assyria, Babylon, Egypt, Phoenician cities, Asia Minor. All these countries are enslaved by Iskander. I will put on a beggar's bag, sprinkle dust on my head, and walk along the roads of the east. I will burn people's hearts with my word. At dawn I will knock on the city gate. I will shout in the squares. In the silence of the starry nights my voice will wake the sleeper. Let the hearts be troubled. Let the eyes light up with evil fire. Let your hands reach for the axe. Spantamano closed his eyelids, and the whole Mother Earth spread out before his inner gaze, great, affectionate. He saw thousands of cities rising above the expanse of boundless plains, noisy, crowded streets, flooded with sunshine, plowed fields where the farmer kneads the warm earth with a rough hand, birthmarks on the thin faces of mothers bent over the cradle. 
barefoot children crawling on the sand, old people whiling away their time by the pool in the shade of the spreading plane trees, young swarthy men crushing bunches of grapes with their feet, funny girls looking at a handsome passerby. Spantamano saw a lot more. He saw the world without embellishment as it is, and his chest ached sweetly with happiness, earth, life, people, that there was some pathetic Iskender in front of them. The Babylonians had a hero, Gilgamesh, Spantamano thought. According to Palant, a certain Hercules is famous among the Junants. We are talking about the hero Rustam. Once they walked the earth and were living people like everyone else. But when they were gone, the people put together legends about them, depicting fabulous heroes. This is because they served the people and descendants will forever remember their names. And me, will they remember me? And if they do, how? They will also start talking about the giant who crushed fire-breathing dragons, or in a thousand years, in two, three, thousand years. There will be a good friend who will break through the layers of the Dark Ages with his thought, see me as I am, and tell his contemporaries about me as a living person who loved and suffered, grieved and rejoiced, kissed women, ate meat and drank wine, like everyone else. Siavaksha's descendant shook his head and laughed. Meanwhile, Tigran, Dioka, and the three mountaineers have not yet decided what to do. Kill Spantamano. That's what Oroba ordered. But my conscience didn't tell me to do that. They understood that they would be charged for the murder of Spantamano. God knows who will, but it will be terrible. Finally, the descendant of Sirdon decided. He stuck his head out of the tent and whispered two words to one of the women passing by. She called Zara. Sit down. Tigran nodded at the nightmare. Zara sat down. Tigran covered his beard with the hem of his robe and pushed his hair back from his forehead. A deep scar opened up. Do you recognize it? Tigran. Zara turned pile and recoiled. Yes, she recognized her father's faithful servant, a cold and merciless man. Quite a few people, objectionable to Oroba, found their end at the hands of Tigranes, and at the same time Zara was delighted. Tigran came for a reason, now everything will be different. You guessed right, it's me. Tigran grinned. Your father sent me. He thought about it. Listen, I've been ordered to remove Spantamano, but... Tigran hesitated. He didn't even want to admit to himself that he was afraid. For the first time in many years, he was afraid to kill a man, but... He's your husband, and I... In short, you go to him and tell him to surrender to Iskander of his own free will. Otherwise, we'll have to grab him and take him to Maraconda by force. And both of them lowered their eyes because they knew that they would never take the leopard alive. Okay. Zara eagerly licked her dry, cracked lips. Her toothache stopped immediately, perhaps from excitement. She went to the hut where Spantamano was daydreaming. She hesitated for a moment, but then she remembered everything she had suffered because of this man, clenched her teeth and resolutely entered the shack. Spantamano was so far away that he did not even notice her appearance. She called out to him dryly. Spanta. The leopard woke up and stared at his wife in surprise. The transition from those vast blue spaces where his imagination was just floating, to this vile hut and to this bad, quarrelsome and stupid woman, was so abrupt and striking that the leopard burst out laughing. Well, what do you want? Surrender to Iskender of your own free will. These words repeated by Zara 
with the insistence of a parrot for several months now, exasperated the Sogdianist. He was shaking with rage. He wanted to hit his wife. However, the Sogdianist restrained himself. He remembered Barrow's words. Brother, don't give up, frowned on the bridge of his nose and said, get out. Then he added, dirt. The last pitiful, barely visible hair, or rather, the cobweb that still connected two so dissimilar people burst, never to be connected again. Zara disappeared as if she had been caught in a gust of wind. Oh, Spantamano, why did you trust Deoka? Hasn't he already cheated on you? Death. Palant, Remir, Vararan, Baro, and Alingar passed in succession through this rocky but still beautiful land. It's your turn, descendant of Siavaksh. Tigran and three huge long-armed messengers are already coming to your hut. Will a pathetic door made of crooked trunks protect you? The door falls with a crash, and the whole village hears this sound. Deoka hears. Zara hears, and everyone is waiting for what will happen next. They realize that they are present at the murder, but they remain silent. They are silent. They are afraid of Iskender. Perish, the last of Siavaksh's descendants. There was a commotion in the shack. The screeching of Spantamano was mixed with the thunderous roars of the Highlanders and the jackal howl of Tigranes. Then the leopard screamed, Zara. Perhaps the leopard, distraught in a deadly melee, suddenly felt that Oroba's daughter was the only close person in his life. Who knows? He shouted, Zara, that's all. That scream froze people's blood in their veins. Zara sat numb, as if she had been charmed by an almighty magician with her spells. Suddenly, a Highlander appeared from the hut, dragging his wobbly legs. He was holding onto his gut with both hands. His naked insides hung down to his thighs. The Highlander took three steps and fell to the ground. The noise in the hut increased. Zara! Spontamano shouted again. The women rushed out of the village so as not to hear this scream. But Zara didn't move. She felt like she was in a nightmare. She had to run, but her body wouldn't move, her legs wouldn't obey, and the scream died in her throat, which was caught in a cramp. A second Highlander emerged from the hut. Holding his bloody head, he staggered to the side, sat down against the wall and sobbed. Zara! Spantamano's last scream came from inside. The scream turned into a loud wheezing. Ara ah ah! The third Highlander jumped out of the hut and, wildly rolling his eyes, rushed to the gate. Then Tigran came staggering out, all cut up in tattered clothes. He was holding something round wrapped in a leopard print Spantamano cloak under his arm. Blood was dripping from the bundle onto Tigran's thigh. Zara didn't move. Deoka timidly approached the descendant of Serdan and whispered, Did you take... What's in your bosom? Tigran sighed heavily, like a butcher tired at the slaughterhouse, and threw a leather bag at Masajet's feet. Deoka quickly bent down and grabbed her with a trembling hand. His heart turned cold. The bag was too light. He quickly untied it, put his fingers inside, and pulled out a diamond. No, it was Diamond's younger brother, though not so beautiful and expensive, a small charcoal, the one that Barrow brought to the leopard from Sogdiana. It was the only treasure left after Spantamano. At the crossroads of the Maraconda, 
There was the rumble of timpani, the ringing of cymbals, the singing of flutes. The Macedonians celebrated the victory over Spantamano. But Sogdiana was silent, flankers and hetiers, archers and shield bearers, holding hands, danced around the sacred bonfires. A thanksgiving hymn in honor of Apollo rose to the sky from thousands of rough hoarse throats. But Sogdiana was silent. In the Yoruba palace, sprawled on crimson Asian carpets, dozens of Macedonian and Greek military leaders, Persian Bactrian and Sogdian nobles savored expensive wine, ate fruits, tender pheasant meat, and praised the offspring of the god Amun. But Sogdiana, who had lost her son, was mournfully silent. Suddenly a brass gong sounded. Everyone left their bowls and stood up. In long oriental robes, wearing a golden crown decorated with huge ram horns, the king of kings Iskander Zulkarnain appeared in the hall, surrounded by a crowd of bodyguards. Dozens of people fell down in unison. A unanimous shout shook the vaults of the hall. Glory to Alexander! Alexander majestically marched to the bronze altar of the goddess Astarte and made a sacrifice of wine and pomegranate fruits. Silver bells rang. A chorus of girls sounded softly and tenderly. Alexander sat on the throne. The brass gong sounded again. The entrance of the hall opened wide. Zara, the daughter of Oroba, entered in a sparkling chiton, beautiful and fragrant. The woman's hair, anointed with fragrant water, shone brightly under a colorful wreath of fresh flowers. Bracelets shone on her wrists and ankles. Zara was walking fast. Snow-white ribbons and transparent folds of a blue veil fluttered softly behind her, and Zara seemed like the goddess Aphrodite, born from waves and sea foam. She held in her outstretched hands a large golden dish covered with a patterned handkerchief. Tigranes, Oroba's servant, Massaget de Yoka, and a crowd of sullen tanned relatives hurriedly followed her. Oh, you fool, Oroba thought of his daughter's husband. What were you looking for? What was he aiming for? I could have lived a hundred years and been happy. He dug himself a hole. In a month, no one will remember about Spantamano. Alexander waved his wand. The singing stopped. Zara went up to the throne and knelt down in front of it on one knee. Tigran, Deoka, and other Masajets knelt. Alexander leaned forward, carefully lifted the edge of the handkerchief draped over the golden dish, and smiled. His smile was so openly joyful, base and unbecoming to the Son of God, that a deep silence immediately fell around him. Alexander sensed a threat in this silence and looked up. It was as if a cold wind had passed through the hall. Everything froze, dimmed, darkened, where a moment ago the flame of the largest torch was violently fluctuating from cheerful shouts. Koinos was frowning. Crater squinted unkindly. Aminta frowned. Melager clenched his teeth tightly. Hephaestion bit his lip. Farnook was speechless. Let Spantamano be their enemy. But the enemy is killed in open battle. Alexander's smile touched their conscience. They felt unbearably ashamed of the bestial screams they had uttered a minute before. But even more menacing was the silence there, outside the windows, outside the walls of the city, all along the valley of the gold-bearing river. The great silence. In front of him, the screams at intersections and the obsequious muttering of Oroba seemed like the pathetic squeak of a mosquito. Through the open windows, myriads of sparkling stars looked out into the hall, 
and it seemed to the chilled Alexander that dozens of Spantamanos, hundreds of Spantamanos, thousands of Spantamanos, hundreds of thousands of once living, now living, unborn future descendants of Siavaksh were looking at him accusingly. The pale Tigran cringed, the Massagets hunched over, destroyed by their own meanness, and Alexander sobered up. What to do? Marry Zara? Sogdiana would never forgive him for that. Punish her the way Bessa punished her for killing Darius. Then the Oroba will rebel. Even if he doesn't rebel, he won't be trusted anymore. And Alexander needs him, really needs him. What should I do? Alexander's gaze fell on Drakil. The marathon runner did not take his black, greedy eyes off Zara. A pockmarked lay earth groveled behind him. And if... Alexander sighed convulsively, leaned back and raised his hand. The people stared at the king in silence. Brothers! Alexander looked around at everyone with a worried look. Spiderman has been killed. He was a brave man, the most worthy of Sogdiana's men. But he turned against us and was punished. You know how much harm he has done. However, let's rise above the little things. We will give Spiderman the posthumous honor that a descendant of Siavaksh deserves. Ptolemyus Log, Artabazus, take the leopard's head to Bahar and bury it on the hill where its ancestors lived. Ptolemaeus Lag reverently took the dish from Zara's hands and left. Since the daughter of the illustrious satrap Oroba, Philip's son continued, turned out to be the culprit of good for us Macedonians, it would be unworthy of the King of Kings to bypass her with a reward. He unfastened a heavy gold chain on his chest, put it around Zara's neck, then called out to the marathon runner. Drakil! The marathon runner started up, not understanding why he was being called. Then, like a hog, rushed to the throne. You all know, brothers, the main commander of our army, a courageous and devoted man who has repeatedly averted danger from the sacred head of your sovereign. Is he worthy to become the spouse of the daughter of the illustrious satrap Oroba? The Macedonians have figured out the master's plan. Drakil is a low man. Giving him Zara is like throwing her to the amusement of rude servants of the wagon train. So Alexander doesn't approve of what she's doing. The Macedonians breathed a sigh of relief and shouted in unison, Worthy, Zara, daughter of Oroba. Alexander turned to the woman who was sitting motionless. Do you agree to become the wife of the hero Drakil, revered by the Hellenists? At the word, hero, Meleager laughed into his fist. Farnuch translated the words of the Lord to the dawn. She heard them as if in a dream. All the days after the leopard's death, it seemed to her as if she had forgotten about something and could not remember in any way. The woman was pleased to return home, thrilled by elegant clothes, excited by the radiance of golden lamps, amused by the ringing of silver bowls. She often laughed, but suddenly at dawn something found. Everything around became vague, vague and incomprehensible. The same thing happened to her now. And only when Farnuk repeated once again, Do you agree? Oroba's daughter replied, Yes, although she did not understand what she should agree with. Oroba, the satrap of Sogdiana, Alexander said loudly, Do you agree to give your daughter to the Greek Drakil? Yes, Oroba said firmly, flattered. For him, Drakil was an important person, a friend of Iskander. To be related to a high-ranking Greek is a great happiness. He also saw that something was wrong with Zara. It was better to give it while they were taking it. 
Otherwise, you would give it back later, but they wouldn't take it. Embrace your wife, Drakil, and kiss her in front of everyone, as it should be according to the customs of the East, Alexander ordered. Drakil, crazy with happiness, he became the son-in-law of the satrap, wrapped his thick arms around Zara, and passionately kissed her warm mouth. A fat smack echoed throughout the hall. Alexander waved his wand again. The musician struck the timpani. The wedding feast began. Eighty years later. Let's leave the world, and the world at least cares. The trace will disappear, and the world would at least care. We moved away, and he was and will be. We're gone, and the world doesn't care. Omar Khayyam, Quatrains. Eighty years have passed. A lot of water has flowed from Vaksh to Lake Wurukarta during this time. A lot of events have happened on Earth. The very next year after the murder of Spantamano, the Macedonians besieged the rock of Shashimir, where the priest of Vakshunvart was hiding. Neither deep snows nor steep cliffs save the cautious Bactrian. In the darkness of the night, helping themselves with iron stakes and linen ropes, 300 Macedonians climb the icy slope to the top of the cliff and with one blow overturned Vakshunvarta's detachment. He himself surrendered to the mercy of the victors. His daughter, the beautiful Rokshanek, became Alexander's wife. Then, of his own free will, he surrendered his mountain nest to Corian. Thus ended the campaign to Sogdiana. In the summer, Alexander went to India, and a year later he defeated Tsar Pora on the Gidasp River. He dreamed of reaching the Ganges, but by that time there were few Macedonians left alive and even those were close to complete despair. The horse's hooves were worn away from endless hiking in the mountains and deserts. Weapons have been blunted in numerous battles. Macedonian and Greek tunics were worn out. A sea and clothes obtained in the east were torn in the impenetrable forests. For 70 days, a terrible tropical rain poured down without ceasing. The storm tore down and carried away tents, overturned huge trees on parking lots. People were shaking with yellow fever. The warriors rattled their swords and threatened the king. And Alexander turned back. Ten years after the start of this unprecedented campaign, the Macedonians returned to the walls of Babylon. Here, at the age of 33, Alexander died without having conquered even a hundredth part of the world. Capturing Asia was not as easy as cutting the Gordian knot with a sword. After his death, the great state that he had created with such difficulty collapsed like a tower from an earthquake. Bactria and Sogdiana fell away from the Macedonians. Dach Arshak a descendant of those docks who helped Spantamano, drove the conquerors out of Parthia. The old Tanaoxar was right. Hundreds of thousands of Spantamanos replaced one, and it was they who became the masters of their country. Gradually, one by one, all those who trampled the land of Sogdiana left for the gloomy kingdom of Hades. The daughter of Vakshunvarta, the beautiful Rokshanek, died in Pella far from her homeland. Oroba died, deposed by Ferdika, who became the first person of the state after Alexander. Ptolemaus Lag, Aminta, Crater, Meliager, and other companions of Alexander, who once chased a leopard, or who were chased by a leopard, disappeared like smoke. Only one person out of all those who saw Spantamano alive still walked the earth. It was Zara. Drakil was not happy with her for long. Although she was distinguished by her wondrous beauty, something incomprehensible often came over her. She became angry and bloodthirsty.
Drakil endured while the army was stationed in Sogdiana. But when the Macedonians marched to India, the cunning Megarian sold his wife to the pockmarked Laertes. Laertes, who had become rich through sneakiness, returned home, left Tanagra and went to Sicily, where the Greek colonists lived. Here in the city of Katana, he opened a brothel. During the First Punic War of the Carthaginians and Romans, he was killed by Samnite mercenaries returning from service from Syracuse. Zara was left alone. Gradually, she became decrepit and aged. The whole of Katana knew this old woman. She was, I think, 98 years old. With a blunt face, a flattened nose and thin lips, stretching out her long, wrinkled neck, the beggar woman slowly and awkwardly, like a turtle, hobbled near the houses and asked for a piece of bread in a drawling voice. But she was beaten with sticks and chased from everywhere because she was Asian. The children threw vegetable cores at her head, the dogs grabbed at the sides and tore at the already dilapidated plaid cloak. The beggar woman meekly endured the blows and smiled ingratiatingly with her toothless mouth in response to curses. She wanted to eat. When she was given nothing, she rummaged through piles of garbage, extracted half-rotted cabbage leaves from them, and supported her useless life with them. Having completely forgotten her native language, she often recited verses from Euripides in Greek in her wanderings around the city. And it's so scary underground. Oh crazy, who wants to die? It's better to live in adversity than to die in the brightest glory. Like a pathetic, half-crushed worm, Zara crawled through the rocky streets of a Sicilian city that was strange to her and silently endured suffering. But sometimes, with the east wind, a strange change happened to her. The old woman hurried to the harbor, sat down by the raging sea, and looked at the sunrise for a long time. The waves rolled back like battering rams, then violently crashed onto the shore, and the piles of wet cliffs shook heavily and hummed like fortresses under siege. Fragments of clouds flew headlong over the rocky chaos of the coastal mountains. And in the noise of the spreading sea, a distant, long-drawn, long, long cry could be heard. Zara, ah, ah, ah! The crazy old woman's eyes began to sparkle. She jumped up on her crooked legs, waved her stick, and began to tell about the angry sun of the south, about the loose sands, about the sacred dances around the nomadic campfires, and the voice of the beggar then resembled the growl of leopards living in her distant homeland. She talked about unprecedented campaigns, chases, and ambushes. She enthusiastically pronounced the names of the Eastern kings. She claimed to be the wife of a great man. But who would believe this decrepit, mindless old woman? Dear ladies and gentlemen, for the continuation of the story of Sogdiana, see the next episode. Leave feedback, write comments, and share this video with your friends. Voiced and translated into English by Vyacheslav Orlov. Peace kindness and love to you and your family.